civic realism and landscape. I'm gonna, we're not going to talk about buildings per se. We're going to talk about the civic realm. For several decades, my office and practice have considered the relationship between the medium of landscape architecture and the making of civic places. And one of my recurring concerns has been that of the purpose and attitudes toward what I'll call real life, civil expression and meaning. Now the central purpose of landscape architecture, as everybody in the room knows, is the planning and design of land and its features, including the positioning and relationships of diverse elements, earth, water, vegetation, roads, pavement, structures, including buildings, for private and public purpose. And familiar topics include parks, squares, piazzas, campuses, and systems of public space, community infrastructure and reservations for the conservation of natural air and resources. It's, the field's too big. There's too many things. But in doing this work, it's common to consider aspects of natural systems and physical character. The soils, the geology, the hydrology, climate, topography, ecology, as well as the cultural artifacts and the historic le legacy of a given location. So those things that we've called the genius loci, to use the very familiar phrase. And in the course of developing plans and proposals for the transformation of land and various sites from one situation to another, and in considering the nature of the proposed result in terms of ecological health and aesthetic merit, broad topics, these are broad topics, they're dealt with extensively in most academic institutions that teach landscape architecture. The design of public space rarely, uh, also rarely raises issues in these schools regarding social purpose and behavior that are often, there, it's really, for all of us who've been teaching for many years, I feel we have to say they're inadequately addressed or understood in the discourse of either professional schools or practice. Civic space has been central to the evolution of urban communities, and it's taken different forms and accommodated different needs and functions through time. While the vast majority of public space in nearly all communities is devoted to movement, to circulation and access, other spaces that are devoted to public encounter to gathering, to recreation, and leisure, remain important and among the most cherished and the most contested. We no longer have cattle markets and public executions in the heart of our cities, but we still use them for civic events and public rituals, for sport, for play, for socialization, for relaxation, celebration, and for protest. Now, the majority of parks, squares, boulevards, and civic spaces that we enjoy as a legacy of the 19th century planning and design in places like New York, London, Paris, Berlin, Chicago, Philadelphia, where I live. They can be seen, in, as you see here, Philadelphia, at the beginning and end of that era of the 19th century. They were largely a direct result of social and economic changes that gave rise to a vast middle class for whom they were intended. And with this development also came a democratization of art and literature that extended well into the 20th century. Developments that I wish to consider against a background of thought and behavior that accompanied these changes. The question of what is real has preoccupied people who care to consider it for centuries. Any number of academics, critics, or philosophers today would answer, well, that depends upon the cultural and relativistic orientation of one's conceptual apparatus. <laughs> but Isaiah Berlin remarked that realism normally means the correct perception of the characteristics of events or facts or persons without the distortions produced by feelings like hope or fear or love or hate or by a disposition to idealize or depreciate or anything else that interferes with accurate observation or action founded on it as a result of emotional pressure of some kind. So realism in the arts as an idea or a problem appears in the mid-19th century as an antagonist of romanticism and various forms of historical, eclectic, revival styles of painting and writing of the previous century, such as you see. It was centered in France between 1840 and 1880. And the aim of realism, according to Linda Nochlin, was the truthful, objective, and impartial representation of the real world based upon the meticulous observation of contemporary life. Well, one must also remember 
that this took place in the aftermath of a number of transformative revolutions and events, beginning with two in England in the 17th century, one that was bloody and one that was bloodless, and two more, one in America and another in France at the end of the 18th century, both of which were violent and both setting in motion events similar yet different and still playing out as social experiments. These social and political events that focused upon governance, upon individual liberty and the universal rights of man took place within the context of the gathering industrial revolution, the redistribution of population in Western countries from agricultural settings to urban ones, the dramatic growth of cities across Europe and America, expanding economies, worldwide colonial exploitation of resources and people, and the emergence of vast capitalist consumer product industries. This painting of Manet presents the mingling of classes of the haute mont and the petit bourgeois, those in government along with the bohemian and the avant-garde, of grandmothers and authors. It was a new dynamic social mix that one sees here in the Tuileries, which had been, it was a public park that had been fashioned from a former royal pleasure garden, as you probably know. So realism in art and design emerged in this era as a deep interest in trying to see and understand what the world was and had become. It quickly became ideological and controversial, initiating the situation of a self-proclaimed avant-garde. Well, the reaction by Jericho and Courbet, Daumier and Millet, the writings of Zola, these two Manet paintings, uh, are one is of his friend Zola, and the other is a version of a creature called Nana, who was in a Zola novel. And the writings of people like Balzac, Flaubert, and others, along with the paintings of Manet and Pizarro, Degas, Monet, Seurat, Sisley, the rest, along with the writing of Baudelaire, the brothers Goncourt, these seem to us today the celebration of both the haute mont and of the bourgeois. They are of, you know, the shoppers, the gossipers, the flaneurs, the cafe societies and workers, the entire world of souls that filled the new grand magazines, we call them department stores, the arcades, the boulevards, the cafes, the bars, and the parks. And the artists and writers concerned themselves equally with the physical and social world of the day. This literature and painting, especially that which we label Impressionism, was a reaction against sentimentality, against fantasy, and against romanticism. And it attempted to directly and accurately present life and whatever subject matter came to the artist's attention, something also referred to by us as the truth. Well, among the last paintings of Manet, which are some of my favorite, are these close, very close, bold, loose, and very powerful observations of flowers brought to him by his friends as he was dying, a portrayal of palpable, immediate world. And one of the things that his generation witnessed and engaged, and that as often as not, was both the setting and the subject, was the new public and civic realm that was produced by the bureaucracy of the prefect of the Seine of Baron Haussmann and Adolf Alphon, their grand projets of the boulevards and the parks. The transformation of the urban structure and former royal enclaves, along with the parks and squares they created from scratch between 1840 and 1860, produced the Paris that painted by Monet that we still know today. These public works served as a model for the grand projets of the later part of the 20th century that were undertaken by Pompidou, by Destang, by Mitterrand and Chirac. Well, one obvious motive for the creation of Parc La Villette, Parc Citron, Parc Bercy, the Jardin Atlantique, Parc Diderot and the others was simply to enhance the city of Paris for the benefit of Parisians and for the citizens in the nation. But another not so obvious motive behind their creation of these parks in the latter part of the 20th century was they were a device to instruct the large influx of immigrants from Africa, the Middle East, and a host of formal colonies how to socialize and behave in public, how to be a French citizen. This was also, by the way, this 19th century period of the creation of what we think of as Paris, this was the era of Frederick Law Olmsted and his remarkable and innovative work. Following upon the thought of Emerson, 
Thoreau and others, and a contemporary he was of Marx and Engels, of Lincoln and Herzen, Olmsted proposed an urban agenda of reconstruction and infrastructure bringing aspects of the natural and rural world into the heart of large cities in an attempt to contribute to the betterment and health of the urban poor as well as the middle class that he represented and from which he'd come. In recent years, his work has been characterized by some of my former students and my peers as romantic and out of date. They've dismissed his works as picturesque and old fashioned. Well, I disagree. Despite the fact that Olmsted was framing his views and his work in the Victorian era, there were reasons to take them as profound and prescient, regardless of how they may have aged or looked to the young Turks today, all of whom have seemed to have been raised on the internet and dreamy digital imagery. From 1870 to 1920, critical dispute in literature focused upon the naturalism of Zola, of Proust, and others who reacted, well, Proust and others reacted strongly against what they perceived to be the overdetermination of works of art for their content alone. And what was seen as an almost total passivity before the raw phenomena. Painting, especially Impressionism, pursued light, color, and issues of the relationship between perception and representation. And without planning or Intent, it, it led to the radical departures of cubism, abstraction, and the abandonment, or eventually even all interest in representation. In America, the so called Ashcan school of Sloan and Henri, of Glockens and others, carried the earlier French agenda forward with a heavy dose of social observation and critique. And as the Great Depression deepened, artists, artists such as Edward Hopper, and Walker Evans shifted the emphasis away from the collective toward the individual and to solitude, as did writers as different in style as James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, and Robert Frost. Debates about realism continued into the 1930s, but they were hijacked and debased by political agendas in America, Europe, and most dramatically in Russia, where a form of radical propaganda virtually drove it from the stage of leading design and art, at least in the realm of civic space, even while social critics such as Lukács, Brecht, Adorno, and Benjamin astutely addressed the relationship between forms of production and the results, sociologically at least, if not satisfactorily aesthetically. Well, what are called the fine arts today wandered off, and over the next 50 years, they went through a series of self-proclaimed avant-garde's, Radical shifts of concept, production, and fashion that you know, that regardless of the brilliance and the merit of the work, which I love as much as you do, had little effective engagement with the larger issues of the urban realm, the quality of life in cities, or the perplexities of design, whether it be of parks and landscape, emerging ecological crises, or even architecture. This, in part, is due to an obsession with novelty and a fixation on what was only one aspect of early modernism, a desire for transgression, to shock and upset the established order, not necessarily a sound basis for the design of public space, especially if a major purpose is to engender community and health. So now, let me try to explain my interest in the topic of realism. In 1967, the year that I made these sketches, I became disenchanted with the design and the creation of buildings. No matter how interesting, which I had been doing for some time in several of the best offices on both the West and the East Coast, it was a time of questioning for every thoughtful person in my generation, whether it was about society and its behavior, or the world, the civil rights movement, the war in Vietnam, oh, the Cuban crisis, you know, Cuban missile crisis, the Russian invasion of Central Europe, the Middle East, you know, it was generally about a society at war with itself in between generations. Well, I retreated first to a cabin at the end of Long Island and then to one on an island in Puget Sound in an effort to refocus upon the world and life. I had studied with the poet Theodore Retke for several years in Seattle and after architecture school and was deeply impressed by what we read, particularly Ezra Pound's one-line manifesto of modernism. Make it new. Uh, yes, of course. 
But what was it, what it was, we sort of had to figure out for ourselves. Also, there was that line of Wallace Stevens where he said, not the idea about the thing, but the thing itself. Well, what one found in William Carlos Williams and Walt Whitman or in the writings and thought of Emerson and Thoreau, they all pointed to perception and confrontation with the physical world and its splendor and its ordinariness and in its minutia. Each in their way demanded starting afresh from a confrontation with ordinary things and the fundamentals of human existence and community. So for several years, I drew a lot and everywhere in an attempt to take up the pleasures and burdens of daily life and nature. I, in quotes, went into the woods, as Thoreau said. And yet, like him, I came out again to live and study life on Skid Road in Seattle and to re-enter architecture briefly for three more years as my friends, my teachers, and I battled City Hall and the business community to save Seattle's Pike Place market, which we actually did. Well, next, I managed to leave America for several years to live, to work and study, to read, to write, and to think in Europe, mostly in Italy and England with doses in France and Germany. And what I saw and absorbed confirmed my instincts to develop a focus upon the landscape of cities and their civic realm, their parks, their gardens, squares, piazzas, streets, and boulevards. The accumulated framework and infrastructure of the public spaces of cities, grand and small, which provide the setting for social interaction that was so fundamental to the health and welfare of their citizens, places that played an important role in their daily life, as well as in the spirit, their understanding, the imagination of workers, poets, artists, of business leaders and politicians. The evolution form elements and management of the civic spaces that I admired fascinated me. So returning to America to teach in a Department of Landscape Architecture that even then was internationally distinguished for its pioneering work in ecological planning and design, I almost immediately became involved in an ambitious transportation and civic design study for Washington, D.C. that was funded by the NEA. Bill Lacey from here. Nancy Hanks and Bill Lacey were there and doing a fabulous job. Among the many proposals we made was one for a light rail system with the portion you see here in these slightly out of focus, I fear, pictures from K Street. Interestingly enough, it is now 40 years later, apparently preceding. My friends ZGF from Portland are actually working on this project now in Washington. So, I was interested to see which of those many things that I'd absorbed of European public life could actually be applied here. I also had come to the conclusion that unless we could make our cities rich and satisfying places to live and get Americans to see some reason to live more densely, we'd never be able to stop the disastrous sprawl of suburban development. We'd never be able to save the rural and agricultural lands near cities that are so important and let alone the more distant forests in the wilderness. This is Bryant Park. I recall the remarkable essay that I'd read in school back in 1959 that J.B. Jackson wrote and published in his small yet prescient magazine called Landscape. It was entitled The Imitation of Nature that then went on to discuss the impossibility of doing so. Jackson wrote, and I quote, as a man-made environment, every city has three functions to fulfill. It must be a just and efficient social institution. It must be a biologically wholesome habitat. And it must be a continuously satisfying aesthetic sensory experience. Wow. Actually, I'll repeat it because it's, it's Vitruvius updated as firmness come out into light, and I'll say it again. As a man-made environment, every city has three functions to fulfill. It must be a just and efficient social institution. It must be a biologically wholesome habitat. And it must be a continuously satisfactory aesthetic sensory experience. Oof. Well, that's a great agenda. Almost immediately upon opening an office in 1976, Bob Hanna and I plunged into several 
rather significant projects over a brief five-year span of intense activity of risk, experiment, and optimism, which you see here. Some might also say great naivete. These included, as you see on your right, the 16th Street Transit Mall in Denver, as you see on the left, the Battery Park City Master Plan in New York, and then in the middle, the Fifth Avenue Terrace for the New York Public Library that was followed by Bryant Park. And in these projects, we were working with some of the leading architects of New York at the time, I.M. Payne Partners, Alex Cooper, Davis Brody, Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer. For some reason, we had ended up working with really wonderful people trying to do things that seemed very difficult. Building an office staff with all of us learning on the job, we began to gain an understanding of the difficulties of producing significant public space in the latter part of the 20th century in the US. Within the next several years, while these first projects were under construction, we also began collaborating with other prominent architectural firms, Skidmore and Merrill from Chicago, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, Frank Geary, David Chipperfield, Ricardo Legoretta. We had a lot of fun working with a lot of really good people, and they was on entire districts and significant public spaces in Europe and America, necessitating further consideration on our part regarding the intersection of purpose, of character, of the elements and the arrangement within particular environments and cultures to shape the public realm. There was Playa Vista in Los Angeles, Canary Wharf, Bishopsgate, Ludgate, King's Cross in London. It was a lot. But we were learning a lot. Lucien Lefebvre has written, each society offers its own, this is Canary Wharf, as you see, under construction and after. Each society offers its own particular space. In ancient Greece, there was the polis, consisting of the agora, various public stoas, streets, and ways. After the developments referred to a moment ago in the 19th century, major Western cities incorporated what he referred to as bourgeois space, with their emphasis upon spaces of exchange and commerce. And as everyone in this room knows, much of what we think of as public places today in this country are really not civic spaces at all. Much of our environment is really an expression of economic determinism subject to privilege, exclusion, surveillance, and commercial management. Well, according to Lefebvre, genuine social space is made up of an ensemble of vital characteristics. First, there is a matter of social practices, including necessary performance criteria and standards of competence. To be able to promenade down a street without having to concentrate unduly or avoid bumping into other people or falling into open basement areas. Second, it's a matter of having sufficient representativeness to the space in question by way of signs and other codes so that it's legible, it's imaginable, and so on. Not to mistake a church for a dry cleaners, for example. And third, social practices require representational spaces embodying sim complex symbolism about, for example, identity, ownership, or civic pride. In civic realist terms, this means creatively making environments for those practices involving the state and civil society in everyday life, which are either widely regarded or warrant distinction. Another key criteria for social space that emerges is the tolerance of real variety of social practices within limits that are well defined by both custom and the physical attributes of the place itself. Over the years as I worked on these urban projects like this is Mission Bay in San Francisco and thought about those that I felt were exemplary and began to watch how the places we'd been making were working, I also realized that Olmsted had got something rather profoundly right namely our need for contact with natural phenomena. For bringing it into the mix uh, as we did here, this notion that, that you have to, we need nature. Considering the increasing urbanization of world culture, questions of human and social well-being, our relationship to nature and its attributes as a matter of health, of well-being, personal and physical development, and social justice, these are topics facing all of the people, anyone who does planning and design in public spaces or urban situations. The needs of children and the elderly, for example, 
not a central audience for civic design in the past, certainly, be, largely because their needs were accommodated through a kind of looseness in the settlement fabric, as well as through family and social structures, unlike most of those today. These are, these are clients rarely <laughs> addressed as influential in the design of cities or public space. Well, as the middle class struggles in America and elsewhere today, just to maintain the situation it enjoyed in the past century, and other cultures attempt to achieve or to deny a successful and open middle class and its amenities, questions of resource allocation and content, of design, of the character, of its form and elements, these pose very serious questions for those who are involved in planning and design. Our work from the start has taken a very clear position on these issues throughout what, through what I have referred to as the conscious perfection of the ordinary. This stems from an interest and a conviction that commonplace and everyday environments, provided they are of sufficient quality, can bring people into contact with the essence of things and thereby provide them with an excitement or deep comfort about the world that they inhabit. Moreover, if one's daily routine and spatial experiences can be rendered well in ordinary terms, both the meaningfulness and congeniality of public life will be greatly enhanced. Instead of being merely banal or mundane, ordinary spatial and sensory experiences can bring us close to the world and in a natural relationship to it. Well, at about the same time that we were developing much of this early work in the office in Philadelphia, as you heard, I was also teaching at Harvard. Well, across the street in Emerson Hall, home of the philosophy department, Hillary, oh, not yet. Not yet, we're not there yet. <laughs> Hillary Putnam, Stanley Cavell, and Nelson Goodman were debating and working their way through what is today referred to as ordinary language problems. In part, having to do with nagging doubts about the relationship to the existence of the world, or at least our ability to deal with persistent problems of meaning. I found their work inspiring in part because of their interest in our capacity to have meaningful, useful exchange and shared lives through the employment of ordinary language. My interest in the ordinary was a decidedly quotidian one. I felt that pursuing it in our work provided a useful basis for deciding things that many of my colleagues felt to be truly undecidable aspects of expressive meaning. There's a lot of talk about sustainability these days, a topic that landscape architects have been concerned with for centuries. A central premise of sustainability is, or should be, that of sustaining health, both mental and physical, as if they could be separate. Since classical antiquity, philosophers, artists, social critics, architects, poets, have posited that urban areas and cities are harsh and unhealthy environments, and that natural and rural ones are healthier and morally superior. They discount, however, that there are serious problems and issues in rural environments as well. One can behave ethically or unethically, morally or immorally in any environment and especially today. I can personally attest to the fact that rural poverty can at times be even more bestial and hopeless than that of urban areas, certainly for children who often have more options and opportunities in cities, believe it or not, than their country cousins. Nevertheless, this recurring feeling about cities is based upon something that has a factual basis. Thoreau, Emerson, Olmsted, they all felt the profound attraction of nature and they wrote extensively and passionately about the subject. Even while they were attracted to and they were working within the context of community and rapidly expanding cities. A few years ago, Richard Louvre gathered together a worrying and thoughtful amount of information about scientific research, educational studies and reports, clinical data, and thoughtful journalists and government agencies in a remarkable book entitled The Last Child in the Woods, in which he makes a case for what he describes as nature deficit disorder. And in it, he presents the case that contact with nature is essential for the healthy physical and emotional development of children. He doesn't present it as a cure-all for the wave of obesity, attention deficit disorders, depression, anxiety, and other ills afflicting more and more people, especially the young and developed societies. But 
the many studies and researchers he surveys make a compelling case for the role that exposure to and familiarity with nature and natural phenomena plays in the care and feeding of our nervous system and our mental development and our acuity. More recently, researchers at Harriet Watt and Edinburgh University in Scotland have conducted a series of studies to test the ancient assumption that the combination of contact with nature, fresh air, and moderate exercise as a break from urban nature, urban routine rather, is fundamentally good for people. I mean, we all kind of think that. Many of us have had the ad hoc and personal feeling of well-being or an improved mood from a breath of fresh air or a stroll through a park on a lunch break or from having a weekend in the country. But these academics decided to see what basis, if any, there might really be physiologically. Well, as reported in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, they attached portable EEGs, those are, you know, electroencephalograms, to the scalp of a number of healthy young adults and sent them out into a predetermined walk through three different urban scenes for a mile and a half in Edinburgh. It included a historic shopping district with handsome architecture, numerous pedestrians and light traffic, then there was a park-like setting, and finally there was a busy commercial district with contemporary architecture of concrete and glass and heavy traffic. <laughs> well, the result was kind of what you might expect. The recorded brainwave showed mental activities in areas associated with frustration and coping with the difficulty while they were in the busy commercial area and calmer as they moved through the green spaces. And rather than merely exhibiting less signs of stress, however, the recorded data even showed similar patterns to the mental activity of subjects involved in meditation or quiet concentration. As one researcher remarked about the mental activity observed in the more natural setting, it's called involuntary attention in psychology. It holds our attention while at the same time allowing scope for reflection. In other words, a brief stroll through a park area is more than a mere palliative against urban stress but it's also a situation that allows for and encourages mental acuity and activity of a productive or creative kind. Well, by the way, all these pictures I've been showing since we left the paintings uh, have been from projects from our own office. This is Battery Park City, New York. These women are walking on the roof of a conference center in Salt Lake City that we did with Bob Frasca and his firm ZGF along with the fabulous engineering firm at KPFF from Portland, Oregon. It's, it's a version of what Alexander Pope referred to as calling the country in. And as suggested earlier, designers, poets, and potentates before Olmsted on numerous occasions proposed the importation of natural landscapes into cities, literally Rus and herbs, the creating of parks that attempted to reproduce aspects of natural scenery uh, you know, in, in gardens and estates and parks. Well, many of these were developed in conjunction with natural features, such as streams, rivers, escarpments, sites that pose difficulty or hazard for development, and they're therefore made opportunity for gardens, villas, parks, and recreation. As a result, many historic urban areas have a legacy of great parks that are well-loved and heavily used. Unfortunately, as most cities around the world and their economic problems have grown in recent decades, many societies have been unable or unwilling to continue such practices at a scale commensurate with the needs of their population for such beneficial domains, or at least not at the scale of the need. I mean, Dallas is unusual. You've, you've been building parks and you've just done this thing with the Trinity River. Other cities in America aren't really quite doing that with that. It's, it's a thing we all used to do and very few people are doing it now. But even on a smaller scale, there is a lot that one can do. Let's look at Columbus Circle in New York. Funny little project. One aspect of many civic spaces from the past that I've studied and grown fond of, whether they were in Europe or America or Asia, is a kind of spirit of generosity, of largesse, a surplus of some kind, whether it be of space or materials or their scale, whether furnishings, in, uh, or just delight in some form. Columbus Circle was a space that had been through much iteration before its devolution in the 1980s into a bewildering and dysfunctional intersection. Bob Hanna and I 
were asked by the Central Park Conservancy to see if we could fix it. But we were then dismissed by Henry Stern, the Parks Commissioner, when we tried to straighten out the awkward entry to Central Park that had been created by Robert Moses. It was a complete mess. Um, among other things, we proposed cutting a number of weed trees that obscured Olmsted's uh, majestic spatial composition. And for Henry, if you cut a tree, you're fired. So I mean, it didn't matter whether it was in the wrong place. So, but then my office worked on it again in the mid uh, 90s for a second time uh, in an ideas competition with uh, our friends Machado Silvetti from Boston, who I taught with. And it was a thing for the Municipal Arts Society. And again, without any result. This time, we were interested in the potential of revealing the layers of the subway concourses down beneath Columbus Circle and the possibility of connecting the spaces visually with skylights, fountains, and seating that would create some sort of public theater of sorts around the monument to this ancient mariner. Well, when it finally became a viable project, and the, needless to say, that didn't happen. Uh, when it finally became a viable project in the late autumn after 9-11, in the waning days of the Giuliani administration, the MTA forbade us from opening up their concourses. And the streets department prevented us from unifying the entire circus, the center island roadways and the surrounding walks with unit pavers of any sort, let alone of stone, as I was proposing. Nevertheless, I was determined to create a more more than a mere refuge from traffic. And I pushed for an open, attractive place into which one could step out of the city, even while you were still in it, to look around and to relax, a place to meet friends, or merely just to be a shortcut across this very difficult intersection. And this has actually been done through the employment of several devices. First, the traffic was reorganized by Philippe Habib, a brilliant transportation engineer and civil engineer, and with three very carefully worked out and lo very carefully located signals and pedestrian crossings. Next, we manipulated the topography. We created a step berm with planting on the outside and fountains on the inside with these broad walkways that were sliced through it. We also inverted what had existed before. Previously, the Columbus Monument had stood in a basin, this miserable little puddle, which even in its peculiarly small size, kept people away from the monument. Well, the entire ensemble was wide open to the streets and traffic that swirled around. It was, just, it was a terrible place to be, frightening. So instead, we created a true island, surrounded by water, in large and generous fountains that mask the noise of the traffic in the city, while they provide movement, and light, and cooling on hot summer days. I like that it was an island. After all, Columbus discovered a group of islands, not a continent. Well, conventional wisdom, of course, has it. It's been for a long time believed that seating, especially park benches, should always have backs to lean against comfortably. Here at Columbus Circle, however, I conclude there was no correct direction to sit facing and that the vertical presence of bench backs would chop up the relatively small space and cut off views of the fountains from the center and from across the space. So we made enormous long curving benches with the cross section of a wide wooden pillow. And as a result, people come at all hours of the day and night to sit or stretch out in all directions in groups and couples, singly, as well as on the rescued steps at the base of the historic monument in the middle. It has truly become a new place in the city that never existed before, despite us being in the middle of a five-way intersection. In fact, people also do use it to traverse, to traverse the intersection, something that was unheard of before. Well, returning to a remark of a few minutes ago, this is a space that provides a generosity and an amplitude of materials, of sensual experience, of scale and spirit with its fountains, the circle of buckeye trees, the planting, the graceful stone and the curving and fulsome benches. Well, you can imagine my pleasure when less than a year after it was completed, the New Yorker magazine used a drawing of it as seen from the windows of Lincoln Center Jazz in the adjacent Time Warner building as a graphic image of the city for one of their festivals. It had already become a recognizable and memorable place that was part of their self-image. It's now on the mental map of New Yorkers as a place and a pleasurable one at that. 
This principle of making places particular and not generic is as important as that of making them well. On one of my first projects back in 1977, when in a public meeting in Denver, I was asked by the head of the regional transportation district why I was on earth I was proposing paving a street, 12 blocks of it, with polychrome granite. <laughs> it was a bit much. I responded that it was better than building such an important street at the heart at the heart of the city, I believe it says, yeah, sorry, at the heart of the city, out of concrete or asphalt. I suggested that it was the single most important public space in the center of the polis, and they couldn't afford to build it cheaply or badly. In my view, it was a place where the citizens could come and be together to see and interact with each other, and the commercial, and it was the commercial core of the metropolitan region, that it needed to be special. I pointed out the relatively short and shorter life even of concrete and asphalt roadways in the Denver region due to their remarkable freeze-thaw cycles, and that stone, especially granite, a material produced under intense heat and pressure naturally, was one of the most durable materials on the planet, and that we didn't know how long it would last before needing to be replaced, since most of the Appian Way was still in place except for a portion that had been stolen by the Mafia for resale as a durable building material. <laughs> How could Denver not afford to build seriously in their most public space? Well, the schema that our office developed along with Harry Cobb, I am Pei's partner, was conceptually very simple. It consisted of pavement conceived as a carpet runner, albeit 12 blocks long, with two rows of trees and lights that were more like floor lamps than street lights. And the pattern was, as you see here, largely inspired by several 19th century Navajo trading blankets. And although I will also admit, <laughs> I did notice some rattlesnake skin belts in a tourist shop along 16th when I was doing the initial field reconnaissance. There was also the ghost <laughs> of the pavement in the Pantheon, which I've always been very fond of in Rome, hovered somewhere around in the back of my mind. So all that kind of got put together. Well, here <coughs> in 16th Street, here it is before and after our project. There are... There are a few, better have some water, excuse me. There are a few benches and a few small fountains at the beginning and end of the central portion. But I didn't want to do much else so as to allow the community to figure out how much else they wanted to do and how they wanted to use it and how they wanted to come inhabit it. The net effect has been overwhelmingly positive. Recent efforts by Downtown Denver, Inc., a business organization in the regional transportation district to make changes <coughs> ran into strong opposition from the citizenry who have declared it a well-loved historic landmark. When I told a public meeting on the topic two years ago that I was the original designer, sorry, that I was the original designer and that several improvements would actually be welcome and appropriate, I was told to forget it. The mall was theirs. They didn't want anyone messing with it. They didn't care that I had done it. It was theirs. These two pictures were taken 30 years apart. This public scheme has helped to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in investment and construction, and it is the most popular and visited site in the city. Our notion that a well-built and handsome street of granite with trees, something of a rhombus or a stretched piazza, that this might work as a sociable space, even in contemporary America, has actually proved successful. The degree to which, for a time, it became attractive to homeless people and young teens with nowhere particularly to go didn't mean there was something wrong with it, only with the general surroundings and with its management and with the general society. I'm happy to say that today it is, again, well-managed and that ordinary middle class office workers, shoppers, visitors, tourists, as well as the disadvantaged, are all happily accommodated. It is truly a civic space. It's open, it's democratic, it's generous, and it's life affirming. We began that project in 1977, 37 years ago. Well, Several decades later, in 2001, I joined a group of other professionals in the city of Portland, Oregon, to study an urban situation that they puzzled about for several generations. What to do in an area facing redevelopment between two distinctly different but important and well-loved sequences of parks? 
the South Park blocks and the North Park blocks, and there was this stuff in between that they were puzzled by. And so we were involved in some planning for several of the spaces. And the first one that was to be implemented was to be on top of a below-grade multi-story parking garage that was already in construction. Oh, here, let's look at it. There we go. <laughs> first one, right here. That's maybe what it was going to be. Here's the South Park blocks, North Park blocks. There is this stuff. And that was, the, that was the project. And you see this hole with the structural steel? That was our site. <sighs> so I said, hmm. So. I proposed to my colleagues, Carol Meyer Reed, a uh, landscape architect I'm very fond of there, and to um, K ZGF, uh, the architects, and to KPFF, the engineers. I proposed that we create a small urban piazza, partly in contrast to all of the other public spaces in the city and the region, and partly because it seemed to offer something that I believed would be popular and well used in that particular location, that particular climate and city. This led to public debates about what should constitute a park today. These are our early schematic drawings. Despite my earlier remarks that I was not particularly interested in, you know, I, I, yes, I'm interested in some things, but I wasn't particularly interested in the debate about what should be a park today, because most of the conversation devolved to be around lawn and about naturalism and about the appropriateness of having a cafe, which I was, I thought, oh, forget it. You know, I, I know the answers. I am neither a formula nor a rule sort of guy, but I simply felt that it would be nice to create a lovely place that looked good even when it was damp on a gray, drizzly day, and where one could sit and socialize, read a paper, have a coffee or a snack, you know, have a glass of wine, meet a friend, watch people, relax. I was interested in comfort and in making it welcoming. This meant that it needed to be open and to have a variety of comfortable, attractive, and generous seating. I also knew that there are few truly special public squares and parks that I really like that don't have water and trees. So Director Park ended up with just that mix of things, as you see the plan below and the section above. So I began with some sketches. In this return for me to the Pacific Northwest, my interest in its damper and fascination for constructed stone surfaces to some extent drove the scheme. Why, I wondered, didn't people in the rainy Northwest cover their public squares with glass, like the great train sheds and arcades in Europe of the 19th century? I'd spent many hours outdoors in winter on a porch when I lived on Bainbridge Island, Puget Sound. You know, one could read, you could write, you could draw, paint, eat, be with friends out of doors most of the year if you were under cover. Also, as every landscape architect and architect knows, water runs downhill. The site, it's a very small one, it's only 30 meters by 60 meters originally. It, it sloped a full story from south to north. So I proposed a couple of level terraces, as you see in this little study model, with a high canopy of glass and a small cafe, some loose tables and chairs with a basin at the lower end of the site to catch and hold the water that was sprayed up out of the pavement or ran down from uphill. There are also benches and various furnishings, such as chessboards on tables and in the pavement in a small space under trees. And like many of our projects, the whole thing is built, as you just saw, over five levels of parking garage. So there are sizable vent and stair structures we have to deal with as well. And so despite concern by some that it needed to be softer with more planting, I argued that Portland was dripping with vegetation that its citizens lived in the most verdant region in the US, and that wasn't what they needed more of in this particular space. I also argued for a cafe with toilets, convinced that it was wrongheaded to build public spaces without these fundamental amenities, and that one could not depend upon neighboring businesses that are subject to the vagaries of economic cycles and wouldn't really want non-customers using their facilities, especially people who were on hard times or mothers who just wanted to change the diapers of their babies. So while arguing for a fountain of some sort, I concluded that it needed to be rather modest, even a silly one, not grand. This was because just across town is one of the great works of the 20th century landscape design, and that is Iris Fountain by Larry Halpern. Whew. Larry was one of my heroes, and that particular work was an enormous inspiration to me when I was entering the field. I remember saying to the team, 
when we were working on it, that with Beethoven down the street, you don't do Beethoven. But you have to do something else, something with a lighter touch. So I conceived of this space here as analogous to a small salon in the palace of the city, sort of one that was more for chamber music and intimate gatherings rather than grand balls and concerts. So this is a little study model that I had one of my partners make for me so that we could play with it and we could use it and talk with our fountain consultant, CMS, from California. Well, as in a number of other projects of mine, the surface, I was very interested in conceiving of the surface as a fabric of stone. And I began with the memory of woven baskets. In this case, several by Native Americans who once lived in the Columbia River Basin. Uh, so unlike Denver, it's monochromatic. And in this case, I wanted the pavement to be quiet, to be calm and elegant, with visual interest and richness just coming from its texture and from its pattern. And so I began exploring various herringbone patterns and block sizes and shapes and textures, as you see in this page from one of my sketchbooks. The beautiful blonde granite that we found, reminiscent of the pale grasses, the straw and the roots of these Native American structures is cut into long, thin blocks rather like Roman bricks. Most of them are flame finished, but there's a series of lines that run diagonally through the pattern that are made from blocks that are reeded, and that is they're tooled with uh, corrugation. Um, water and light and dirt enhance this texture and this difference. Some days and from some directions it's sharp and it's obvious, and on others and under different conditions, it's more subtle, barely noticeable. Stair treads that feather into the slope are handsomely tooled and modular also with the pavers. And as often happens on our projects, the workmen became really intrigued and they got into what they were doing and they were making and they, they realized this is special and they did a beautiful job. A further aspect of this new urban place is that we convinced the city government and the streets department to extend this biscuit colored pavement from building face to building face from east to west, across the square and across the streets. Vehicles entering the space driving in the other direction, north south therefore, move into and through a public square, sharing the same surface as the pedestrians. The stone and its texture causes them to move more slowly than they do in other blocks. Such things really do matter. For a number of years, our office has conducted an ongoing set of experiments in public seating. The most famous being that, of course, of introducing loose chairs into Bryant Park in New York. This was really pretty old hat in Europe uh, at that time, been done for a century. But it was a real stretch for New Yorkers 30 years ago. And in several projects since, I've explored another counterintuitive notion and that is the backless bench mentioned earlier. Most people, probably most of you, believe that public seating should offer back support for the obvious reasons of comfort and a sense of support and also of security of nobody coming up behind you. There are, however, I think numerous instances when backs on benches are undesirable due to contextual issues of sight lines and views and a need to allow people to face in more than one prescribed way. How then to make such benches attractive, comfortable? Well, the first time I tried it at Wagner Park in Battery Park City, I decided to make them overly generous, to make them, you know, to make seating that was unusually broad and very long, theorizing that it would be an attractive thing in itself, and it would allow people to sit in opposing directions without impinging upon one another, or to sit or sprawl or lie about as they chose. It had the profile of an enormous cushion. <laughs> it, it's just kind of wooden cushion, but it was stretched. And while vaguely, it also recalled a boat deck and other wooden structures as well along the harbor. Later evolutions at the Washington Monument and in Columbus Circle convinced me that there were other times and places for this device, as well as the ubiquitous loose tables and chairs and the continuous wall-mounted benches that we have also employed. Well, we ended up using them all in Director Park. 
This is not a trivial aspect of the sociology of the place. People are free to select and associate with others or to maintain their independence in a remarkable variety of ways. It allows for a truly open and civic space that is used by all manner of people, old people, young people, office workers, the homeless, mothers with prams and teenagers, opera and moviegoers. People of all classes and incomes can be seen here at various times throughout the day and night and in all seasons. The somewhat frequent light rain in the region falling on this tall civic scaled canopy has led to a series of planted filtering troughs that form the support for a bench uh, as at the terraces while it, that this, there's this big long trough that it provides a place to hang benches, but it also deals with the difference between a sloping sidewalk and the flat terraces. You try and put as many things together as you can. It's, things that only solve one problem quite often are too limited or not quite right. Well, the water falls on the, on the stone streets and it, much of the square, and it's led to planters along the two streets where it's filtered before it's passed into the storm drains. And the water running into the fountain is caught and filtered. It's treated, it's recycled. So all the water we could possibly get, we grab it and we hold onto it and we try to take care of it and do something with it. Journalists and professional design juries, jurors who <laughs> first looked at this park, they were, you know, they were mildly friendly, but, uh, but they referred to it as stark. Uh, they seemed kind of puzzled that it apparently worked. It was apparently okay. It bothered them. And partly I think the problem was, it, unfortunately, it was called a park. And, 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 and it didn't, because it was called a park and it didn't have bounteous planting and lawn, that didn't, they, they didn't like that. Well, they didn't seem to notice that it was bounded by trees, <laughs> which, if my colleagues and I have gotten our homework right, are going to continue to grow for many years until they're quite large, have a significant presence in this tiny place. There may be too many, actually. Time, you know, is an aspect of our medium that most people can't see, they don't feel, they don't know that's part of the medium. So this little bosque in this small space with this chessboard is composed of yellow woods a wonderful, lovely tree from the Appalachians that was discovered by John Bartram. And it, it's gonna surprise people there when with this long pendulous racemes of white blossom when they hang down in the spring, more or less heavily every other year, which is also part of the, huh, that's odd. Hmm, this year it didn't do much. Or wow, look at it this year. That, that will kind of puzzle them, I think. So while all the parts of this park are particular, are perfectly ordinary, the ensemble isn't. Director Park has been enormously popular, and despite its small size and its lack of lawn, it attracts a wide diversity of people of all ages and economic stata, strata throughout the day and into the night. In 2012, the Park Department took counts of users every day through the summer. Between the hours of noon and 7 p.m., there were typically more than 100 people per hour using this small space. In August, an average of over 2,000 people were counted in the park between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Old people, mothers with prams and children, office workers, shoppers, they all find their way to it and they all hang out. Now while one must be wary of such methods in judging quality, high body counts from Vietnam or Iraq are one of the most dramatic proofs that quantitative measurement does not necessarily equate with qualitative success. Even so, the people of Portland have embraced this new portion of their public realm with enthusiasm. And despite the useful nature of our work, I continue to believe that what we do remains very much of an art. It's not a science. And that contrary to popular belief, it's easier to teach science and technocracy than it is art and humanism. Every place is different. And to try to fit the design of good civic space into some Procrustean bed of urban design rules and formula is both fruitless and wrong. Earlier, I link the emergence of realism with the emergence of the middle class in modern society, as well as a dramatic development in the creation of civic space for public health and recreation. The, 
The economic and political developments that have accompanied this has delivered remarkable benefits and great disappointments in the successes and failures of democratic governments and materialist consumer society. The worries of Alexis de Tocqueville, of Thoreau, and Emerson about the competition for control between the individual and the group, the threats to minorities and the tyranny of the majority have played out against a background struggle for self-realization and for freedom. The work of our office takes a very firm stand on both. The public spaces must be open, accessible, generous, and welcoming to individuals of all sorts, and designed so as not to be dominated by any, yet encouraging a respectful and sociable behavior. This has been one of the great lessons in the rise of the middle class, something that's envied around the world. There are attitudes, approaches, instincts, and feelings that I have tried to share with you today that when employed with care and informed with appropriate knowledge and a concern for beauty and the human spirit, as well as affection for life and society, can make the chances of success high. Much of what one does while in the act of working seems to flow from instinct and to be dependent upon the many things one has seen, done, learned, and filed away somewhere, often deep down. And all of this leads to a recurring paradox within modernity. There's a deep yearning and apparent need for new paradigms that can cope with the evolving scale and character of our urban landscapes on one hand. And on the other hand, we have a continuing need for older, timeless relationships and essences, for ancient tropes regarding humans and nature. One of the hallmarks of nearly all avant-gardes and of youth is a desire to challenge authority in the way things have been. Transgression is a default position for those who wish to make their mark in the arts and design as an opening career move. It works for all of us, I did it. Yet, a disruptive public realm is not particularly useful or a benefit to society. Many prominent designs, especially in architecture in recent times and in current journals, have little concern for the success of cities and society, or even the many aspects of a current understanding of sustainability. So I don't want you to mistake this as some sort of conservative argument in disguise or a rear guard attack upon contemporary design. It would be more proper to call me a good old fashioned modernist of the sort that pursued an overt progressive and political agenda. I have purposefully distanced myself from postmodernism, from new urbanism, from landscape urbanism, and the more extreme self-proclaimed ecologically determinist camps. Peter Rowe, the former dean of the GSD at Harvard, has written that underneath our early work at Bryant Park and Battery Park City, there was a use of classic typologies and a slippery use of precedents that directed people toward familiarity, use, and behavior that was as ethically based as it was aesthetically. I'm sure this is as true today as it was then. I also know, as hinted earlier, that well-designed cities cannot imitate all of nature but they can incorporate key aspects of it that we find so stimulating and essential. Those aspects that set in play the beautiful shapes and forms, elegant and simple, elaborate and complex, changeable and recurrent, stable and moving, those passages of shade, pools of light, the play of vegetation, changes of surface and level, varying views and perspectives, the splash of water, its echoes and music, the harmony and contrast of colors, and the unpolluted sun. These are all very ordinary things, but making them available for citizens in their daily routine at the heart of our cities is to serve up a dose of reality, and it's a life-affirming nature, and to help us draw close to life itself. Thank you very much. <laughs>